Hi there. Uh, welcome to All Things Political, uh, the Steve Leal's uh, public affairs show. Uh, it, uh, Steve, of course, is uh, still recovering, and uh, we wish him well. We hear that he's uh, doing much better now. But uh, meanwhile, uh, filling in for Steve is uh, me, Tom Prozelski, and uh, Jeremy Lasher. And uh, Jeremy, we had some things you wanted to talk about today. Yeah, right off the bat. Sorry, we're getting in late. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, but that leads us right into our first story. The FCC just killed net neutrality on a 3-2 party line vote with Republicans. Um, the Republicans are trying to downplay this, saying, oh, nothing bad is going to happen. Nothing's going to, to be different than what you see. The, the problem is the reason that these FCC rulings were put in place in 2015 was because Verizon had sued the FCC for trying to prevent them from going out there and charging more for competitors and trying to throttle their competitors' bandwidth. Uh, so the last two years, we've actually seen some protections in place for consumers and for smaller businesses. Now the FCC has decided that they're going to roll that back. This was, uh, again, it's a backroom deal, three to two, all three Republicans. They actually had to clear the room uh, for some supposed security concerns before this vote went through. Uh, this this decision has been plagued for the last months with controversy. Um, the, the the chair of the FCC had stated that many of the public uh, comments that called for us continuing net neutrality and making sure that we actually had a fair and free internet service uh, throughout the country, make sure that people had access to every site they want to have site. Um, he claimed that that system had been corrupted by spammers and that all they were seeing was spam messages of people telling them that they wanted to keep net neutrality. Uh, so they decided that they were only going to take legal uh, arguments in favor of, of net neutrality, either staying as it was or, or ending these protections. Now, of course, the people who can afford a large legal argument about uh, this side tend to be Internet providers who might have – a, a, a personal interest in financially seeing net neutrality end and then being able to get a leg up on competitors. Yeah, and it, it, it um, I think some of the analysis I've seen of this gives a little hope in, in that it's going to take a while for this, uh, for us to actually see any negative changes in the internet environment, which gives Congress some time to act on this. I, I, um, I keep thinking back to um, when I was in the legislature and we were fighting the cable industry on an issue that was very similar and had some of the same arguments on either side. And it was conservative Republicans who ended up being uh, the saviors on that because they, they prefer to have, it is in their best interest to have an open and, and free internet because they are usually feeling like there's this this uh, media conspiracy to silence them, and if if we have this um, this new system in place, it's going to be much easier for media giants to silence differing points of view, whether they're conservative or liberal. So it'll be interesting to see moving forward what coalitions develop on on the side of. Uh, of net neutrality as the issue inevitably, I think, is going to move to Congress. I think there will be tremendous pressure. And now FCC has said they're going to take the next two weeks to decide what the final version of these rules are going to be going forward. Uh, one of the two Democrats in the commission, Jessica Rosenworcel, called today's vote uh, a rather rash decision, pointing out that this puts the FCC on the wrong side of history, the wrong side of the law, and the wrong side of the American public, and gives Internet providers the green light to go ahead and discriminate and manipulate your Internet traffic. And again, there were over 22 million public comments made to the FCC over the last year as this was being debated, uh, and then the, the FCC commission threw out – uh, many of those claiming that 7.5 million of them were spam because they had the same message over and over again. Now, this is something we see a lot from different political campaigns on, on issues, asking people to to attach their name to a message that's already pre-printed, something like a moveon.org petition. that has the same messaging as going. We haven't seen Republicans so far that I know claim that those messages were spam and weren't the legitimate concerns of people. Uh, but we do know that it might be an end of the move on style petition era if people are just going to ignore them and claim that they're they're not real because they don't have a differing message 
Um, how do we start changing how we communicate with government entities and campaigns on issues? Well, yeah, and, but there there is a point to that. I, I think that uh, one of the flaws I see with kind of that move on move on dot org model is the uh, is that you know when I was an elected official, we a lot of us saw through that very quickly. We would suddenly get dozens sometimes hundreds of emails that were all identical about a given issue and it would be very easy using google you know just take the first sentence and put it in google to find out where they came from like one time it was it was consumer union talking about uh infections in hospitals and we were getting hundreds of emails about hospital infections when there was that issue simply wasn't on our agenda um i i think that um uh, it would probably be a good thing if we stopped, if you know, interest groups stopped doing that, uh, and and maybe just said, here's some talking points. We want you to emphasize this. Please write a write something in your own words, and then it's going to be much harder for people to dismiss these things. And what we've seen in in net neutrality specifically is a, a large conglomeration of companies. Uh, uh, forgive me, they were uh, – the, 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 the Broadband for America is the name that the coalition came up with, which include AT&T and Comcast and Chart Communications, ran a full-page ad in Washington Post that made commitments to consumers that they would practice the, the preservation of open internet, uh, making such promises as that they would not block legal content, they would not throttle – uh, data speeds, and they, they would make sure that they did not practice unfair discrimination. What they didn't mention, what's kind of glaringly omitted here, is paid prioritization. So until about eight months ago when uh, Chairman – and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so I apologize. Ajat Pai? Ajit Pai. Ajit Pai. So when Ajit Pai started talking about uh, how he was going to repeal net neutrality, that's when Comcast on their website took down – uh, a commitment that they would never prioritize internet traffic. That that page has changed about eight months ago. It hasn't come back up. So whether they, they keep with their promises of not blocking content or not throttling other people's content, uh, we're very likely going to see in the near future a chance for you to pay just slightly more to make sure that your content comes through as a priority. And, um, you know, I, I briefly worked for a contractor for Verizon, and I can tell you firsthand that Verizon already throttles data. Uh, they, uh, that's, that's been their, um, basically if you want data that's not throttled, you have to pay a premium for it. And that's, uh, that's a, been a business practice that's, they've found acceptable for a while. So to say that they're not going to throttle Assumes that they're not throttling in the first place, and that's just not the case. Uh, it's it's really disturbing that they always make this argument. Uh, as I said, when they were when the cable industry was doing was acting against public access uh, 10, 15 years ago, their argument was, well, if we don't get this, we're not going to be able to invest in all this new technology. At that point, they were talking about on-demand technology and everything like that. Uh, it took them about eight years to get around to actually investing in on-demand technology, even though we passed their bill for them. The same industries are making that argument here. They're saying that they're not investing in infrastructure because they uh, these net neutrality rules are in place. And that's that's simply bunk. And the, the argument on the right is that this is about regulation, how the, the government shouldn't be in the, the business of regulating – you know businesses and how they grow, but the problem is regulations are there for the protections of the consumers, the protections of citizens and people who live in this country. We have EPA protections and health protections to make sure that people have a chance to have a healthy environment. We have uh, protections on our internet usage to make sure that ideas have a place to get out there. Uh, one of the major concerns about net neutrality being lifted is that it will affect disproportionately people of color. Uh, who have used Internet and used social media services lately uh, in the last decade to really push their ability to organize, their ability to fight back against systemic racism, and systemic problems they've seen throughout society. If the person who's controlling the way you get your message out now has the ability to stifle you actually getting that message out, it's going to affect how you organize and how you're able to, to combat problems that you're facing. 
Yeah, and, and now um, suddenly folks are revisiting, at least in Tucson, they're starting to revisit the idea of municipal broadband where um, there really wouldn't be any motive in, in shutting down certain content. There's problems. There's quite a lot of practical problems with municipal broadband, like the fact that uh, maintaining it every year would actually be more expensive than setting it up, which is unusual for infrastructure. But uh, it, it, it really is worth looking at maybe in uh, some more kind of nonprofit models for uh, for Internet service and expanding on that. I mean, it would be great if you'd have some community some community organization just start to invest in setting up their own internet system. Another concern is uh, mostly for content creators. Startups are going to be at an extreme disadvantage against established businesses who have the money to put behind programs uh, that, that will let them get out to more people. Right now, we just saw Disney bought up Fox Media, and through them, they actually got a rather large share of the internet streaming service Hulu. Now, Disney was talking about starting up their own streaming service, but now they have a one-third share in Hulu alongside Time Warner and Comcast, both of which are uh, internet providers. They just got a major leg up in the game against competitors like Netflix to show that they have a system where if you're a Time Warner customer, you might get faster download speeds or faster streaming speeds through Hulu than if you were trying to watch a, a show on Netflix or a movie on Netflix. Those are two giants in the game. When are we going to see the net, net the next Netflix, the next Hulu, and how are they going to be able to compete against behemoths that already have millions and billions of dollars to throw at, preventing them being able to compete as a streaming service or as a download service? Yeah, and then that's the, that's the whole thing. We we forget that during the '90s, uh, the internet grew, and all these businesses around the internet grew largely because the government was stepping out of it. And the government, but the government was stepping out of it not to let the big players have their way, but the government was stepping out of it basically to let these smaller entities grow. Uh, and it, it really kept the, what was happening in the nineties really kept corporations, large corporations out of what was going on. And now we've brought them in and told them they can do whatever they want. Uh, we need to go to a break here in a second, but we want to come back and talk about the election on Tuesday in Alabama, uh, kind of the what happened there, what the effects are going to be going forward in 2018, 2020, what we can learn from this. You're listening to All Things Political with Steve Leal. This is Jeremy Lasher and Tom Brzezowski. We'll be right back. Welcome back to All Things Political with Steve Leal. This is Jeremy Lasher and Tom Brzezowski filling in uh, for Steve Leal. Tuesday, we saw a, a massive wind change in Alabama. We saw a Democratic senator, Doug Jones, defeat uh, an embattled Republican, uh, Ron Moore, for God, the first time in decades, uh, at least as far back as I can remember. Um, you know, Moore's campaign was beset by a number of accusations, and he didn't help himself when he came out with some pretty racist remarks going on. Uh, but we saw a wave of Democratic voters, uh, primarily African-American men and women in, in the, the southern part of the state, that just came out at levels higher than we saw in 2012 for Barack Obama. Yeah, and, and it's, it's interesting because the analysis of the, the, of the victory, especially from conservatives, seems to be that this was all about the accusations of, of uh, child molestation against Roy Moore. Uh, and I think there was actually a lot more going on than that. Uh, the uh, It's pretty clear that uh, Doug Jones, he had, uh, he had uh, Joe Trippi running his campaign. They had a lot of stuff set up already. They were really working the African-American vote. Uh, the African American electorate is far more sophisticated than most uh, political commentators give them credit for. Every uh, every social science study of, of African American politics says that the, the African American community tends to be more politically aware than uh, other communities in general. They knew all about Roy Moore. They knew he was a bigot. And they knew that Doug Jones was someone who had a history of um, 
sticking up for the African-American community and listening to the African-American community. He was a tough prosecutor against KKK and such. And uh, he was going to have a high African-American turnout regardless of um, any stories that turned up against Roy Moore. Basically, the Republicans, they nominated a bigot. And they should have drawn the line well before these accusations came out. And on election night, as the the polls were, were coming in and we actually saw the first uh, returns that showed Doug Jones in the lead, uh, I was listening on the radio. I actually flipped over to the Fox News radio channel, and they were doing everything they could, basically backflips to try and distance themselves from, from Moore, claiming that he wasn't truly a Trump Republican and that you know he was a, a sexual predator. Finally, they they finally came out and said, yes, this this guy's accusations and, and his problems were the reason he lost. This had nothing to do uh, with the rest of the country. Now, Vox has a great article that came out uh, a couple of days ago. It's called "It's Not Just Scandal: More Lost in Alabama Because the GOP Agenda Is Toxically Unpopular." So, just to quickly recap what's happened this last year since Trump took office and has been trying to do everything he can to destroy the, the office of the presidency's credibility around the country and around the world. We've seen Republicans lose governor's mansions in Virginia and New Jersey last month. We've seen about 65 special elections for House and state legislators where Democratic candidates have run nine points ahead of Hillary Clinton on average. Uh, we've seen President Trump's net approval rating lower today than any previous president since they've started measuring approval ratings. Um, the Republican tax bill, for lack of a better word, they're trying to pass through is less popular than any previous past tax bill that has been measured. So we're seeing across the country moderate Republicans, independents, libertarians, Green Party, Democrats who have all woken up to the idea that while the message used to be, oh, you vote for the lesser of two evils and, and people use their privilege to say they couldn't bring themselves to vote for a Hillary campaign or to vote for a moderate Democrat who was going to work for the status quo, what we're seeing in the actual elections is that we've changed that process and people are showing up, at least so far, to vote for a Democrat even if they don't agree with every one of their stances and show up in numbers we haven't seen before. Uh, to really send a message to Donald Trump and the Republicans that we're tired of their their bank heist parading as a political party. Yeah, and then the parade of excuses is pretty incredible. They were they were very much pushing for this guy for a long time, and and to say that he wasn't uh, pushing the Trump agenda is ridiculous because he basically his rhetoric was basically identical. His rhetoric, his agenda was basically identical. And um, I, I think uh, I, I saw an interview when they were interviewing some African-Americans who'd voted for uh, Doug Jones. And one of the guys said that uh, he was uneasy about the current president because, well, he, well, actually, he said it helped that Trump was in the White House because it meant that all these people like Roy Moore felt emboldened to say what they really think. Uh, it used to be they would couch their racist positions as something else, law and order or whatever. But this guy actually came out and said, yeah, I, I really don't think African-Americans, women and gays have a place in this country. And, uh, you know, it just turns out that African and women, African-Americans, women and gays will turn out to vote against you if that happens. And maybe maybe that's a good thing. Well, and as a person of Jewish background, you know, it, it really made me less concerned to know that Mr. Moore and his wife had a Jewish friend, one of them, who also was a lawyer for them. Uh, so that really set aside some of the concerns I personally had, but many of my friends uh, didn't. One of the things we're seeing now that the numbers are finally coming out of Alabama and their totality is that while Doug Jones got 93.5% of Hillary Clinton's raw vote total in this election, an off-year election and a special election. Uh, Moore only got 49.8% of Trump's votes. Uh, so Trump turned out and won Alabama in a landslide. Uh, but when Moore was running, many of those Republicans either chose to stay home or to switch their votes. We also saw Senator Shelby, a one-time Democrat who turned Republican back in the 90s, uh, who had told people that he couldn't vote for more, that he was going to write in a prominent Republican in the district, that while he preferred to see the, the Senate go to a Republican, it shouldn't be more. Uh, we had a number of other 
Jeff Sessions included, who refused to say who he was voting for, but had spoken out against more at times. We saw the the RNC and the president go back and forth on if they were endorsing him, if they weren't endorsing him, flip flopping all over the place, uh, not having an answer for how to fight back against accusations of, of sexual molestation against a child, against inappropriate uh, sexual attention paid to to women who are 17, 18, 19 years old. The Republican Party doesn't seem to have an answer for this, and they're trying to isolate and say it was just Roy Moore. It wasn't a Republican problem. Yeah, and, and the uh, when those accusations came out about Roy Moore, I thought there was that something even more damning than the accusations, because, of course, anybody can make an accusation, was the the fact that his response to the accusations and the response of his partisans to the accusations was – First, to start lobbying insults at the accusers, then to say, well, it's not really a problem because uh, there, there, there's some kind of theological justification for it, or, hey, that's just the way we do things in the South. And that's pretty much an endorsement of what Roy Moore was accused of doing, and that was pretty disturbing. And on the opposite side, politically, in Nevada, when Representative Ruben Cahoon has been accused by by two women of in his professional life acting in a sexually inappropriate manner. A House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi has come out and asked him to step down. We've seen a number of Republican or sorry, a number of Democrats coming up, including Representative Ben Ray Lujan from New Mexico, you know, chairman of the House Democrat Campaign Committee, saying that he must step down immediately. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw the same thing with Al Franken, where Democrats coalesced around and said. This is a problem for us. We have zero tolerance for sexual assault, for sexual prayers, for sexual harassment in our our leaders, and you need to step aside so that we can fix this problem. On the Republican side, we're not seeing that. When Trump was running for president, we kept hearing that it was locker room talk, that this is a man who on video said some despicable things, but they're dismissed in the the urge for power, whereas Democrats have taken a a different track that says – We may lose some of our our loudest voices in the progressive and liberal movements, but their actions mean that we have to clean house and make sure that our leaders going forward are held to a higher moral standard. Yeah, and it's interesting that the the two Republicans that have kind of been, uh, let's just say, sacrificed uh, in the wake of this scandal are uh, Trent Franks uh, from up in uh, the West, the uh, the Valley of the Yakes up there, and uh, and this uh, Fahrenheit from Texas. And these are not exactly stars in their caucus. Trent Franks has managed to um, be in Congress for 17 years, 13 of them in the majority, and has not passed a single piece of legislation. He is not someone who um, they're exactly going to miss in the Republican caucus, and Blake Farenthold was just a clown. So, uh, you know, it was very easy for them to dismiss these guys. And, you know, I mean, you know, not to dump on Franks, or maybe I should. I mean, the, you know, Trent Franks is just a, a sterling example of kind of the failure of Republican political culture in Arizona. Not only have there been stories about Trent Franks' creepy behavior for 20, 30 years, but... Um, he uh, he's a single issue guy who doesn't who is not really a big a deep thinker in any way shape or form, and uh, I remember when he first got elected that was my first year in the legislature. One of the things people were talking about with Trent Franks was that it was taking an awful long time for him to set up his local congressional office. That constituent concerns were being sent to John McCain's office because even though he'd already been in politics for a long time at that point, it never occurred to him how he was going to set up his local camp, his local uh, congressional office. It took him like eight or 10 months to get around to doing that. This is not a guy who ever took his work very seriously. Um, and it, as far as fair and whole, as I said, he was a, he was a bit of a, an absurd figure and, um, it's just it, and those are the two guys. I mean, they could basically the Republican caucus can afford to be rid of these guys and then pretend the problem's over. And Frank stepping down actually opens up uh, what Republicans are hoping is going to be a good shot for some of them. 
Uh, so far, it looks like three have stepped forward with a num- number of other Republican names being thrown about. So currently, Arizona House Majority Leader Steve Montenegro has announced he's jumping into the, the race. Former Corporation Commissioner Bob Stump has thrown his hand into the race. Uh, former State Rep Phil Lovas, who was working in the Trump administration, had just been brought on, has actually resigned his job in the administration and expect him to jump in quickly. We're also hearing names like Senator Debbie Lesko of Peoria, Kebra, uh, Kimberly Lee from Phoenix, and Tony Rivero of Peoria are all looking to jump into the race. And Montenegro has kind of shown the complete cluelessness of the Republican Party in with regard to this. He's actually publicly saying right now that he is uh, – that Trent Franks was his mentor. He is Trent Franks protege and he is going to continue Trent Franks work in Congress. So that's, that kind of shows that they're not learning anything. So, uh, it's, uh, the little man in the booth over there is telling me that it's, uh, it's time to move on to a commercial. So we'll do that. This is, uh, all things political with Steve Leal. We'll be back in a few minutes. And we're back with All Things Considered with Steve Leal. This is Jeremy Lasher and Tom Brzezelski filling in for Steve this week. Uh, We are just discussing about Congressional District 8 and Trent Frank stepping out, the number of Republicans who are stepping forward. Uh, A little closer to home in southern Arizona, we have Congressional District 2. And last week we saw a name thrown in that could shake up the race. Uh, Leah Marquez Pearson, who is the president of the Latino Chamber of Commerce here, sorry, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce here in Tucson has declared that she will be running for Congressional District 2 as a Republican. Uh, Currently, Martha McSally holds that seat and has claimed that she's still running for re-election. But in private, you know, closed-door meetings, she has expressed interest in the U.S. Senate seat when John McCain steps aside. Uh, Seeing John McCain back in the hospital this week for what's being called routine care over the the cancer diagnosis he had, uh, it's likely that Mr. McCain might not continue his Senate seat uh, coming close to the holidays. You might want to spend more time with family. So we could see some changes there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult because you don't want to tell someone just, just because they're sick that they shouldn't be serving in the Senate anymore. But those of us who are old enough remember, uh, Mo Udall, who, uh, we, none of us really wanted to see him leave the Congress, but he, but we also knew he was not in any shape to continue and uh, it was really affecting the his his ability to continue in office so i i'm not you know of course it, it's all up to to mccain i mean he is still he was elected to a to a six-year term so i mean he he um it's his his right to continue that that's kind of his obligation but it'll be interesting to see what would happen if he steps down uh it's Difficult to say. I guess now we have a uh, we have a law that was passed fairly recently that has never been invoked that allows a governor to uh, appoint a U.S. senator. Uh, we've never had that situation here in Arizona, uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. What kind of jockeying there is for that, uh, and. Uh, it's difficult to see if there's anybody in Arizona that actually has the stature to be a senator. We don't really have anyone in the uh, in our current political landscape who we can picture being uh, Carl Hayden or Barry Goldwater or anyone like that. There, you know, it's it's just we just have a bunch of hacks. Well, and topping the list of potential people that uh, Governor Ducey may appoint, Trent Franks was at the top of that list for for a while, for the last year. Uh, Martha McSally another was up hack. there. Another hack. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martha McSally, who tries to sell herself as a moderate while voting with the, the current administration, lives 95% of the time, um, who you know has made some serious – Serious decisions on on her part to deny Arizona's health care, to be in support of this this tax bill that is going to see poorer and middle class Americans getting tax increases, while the wealthiest one percent of one percent are going to see you know thousands and if not millions of dollars coming back to them uh, for some of the corporations. So if Martha McSally is out, that completely changes the congressional district two race that we're facing down here. Uh, right now, there are six Democrats running in that race, and 
with McSally, there are there are two Republicans. Uh, but Tom, you had an idea of another Republican that's well known in Pima County who may throw her hat into the race as it is. Yeah, I, I, I we've heard rumors about Allie Miller, who has done a lot to endear herself with the the right wing of the Republican Party and and Republicans in general. Although I don't think a lot of uh, mainline Republicans would support her if if uh, Leah Marcus was in the race. The um, I think the difficulty that Leah is going to have is that the center of gravity for the Republican Party in that district is Cochise County. And Republicans in Cochise County are not going to look very kindly on her. She is not well known in Cochise County uh, as she is you know, in Tucson. Um, and um, as much as I, over the years, have wished she would take some more strident positions on immigration issues, uh, her positions are not ones that would be supported by Republican voters in Sierra Vista and Tombstone and places like that where they, they tend they tend to take a much harder line, a uh, negative line on immigration than uh, Leah has. Well, with both of those candidates coming from the northwest part of the district, uh, the area of the foothills, neither of them is going to have much name recognition down in Cochise County. Marcus Peterson has a history in Tucson proper working with business communities. Uh, while I've rarely agreed with anything she's put out as a position paper on, on, on issues that face the city and our community, uh, she is well-respected in her area. Allie Miller, on the other hand, her, her largest base tends to be the people who are screaming that everything is broken and watch us break it further. Uh, you know, Miller is famous for claiming that uh, nobody's allowed to visit her office without getting, you know, security to, to buzz them through because she's afraid of people. She asked the, the sheriff to run by her house repeatedly. She has had numerous fights with other supervisors Um her, her biggest thing this year that I remember being a part of was uh, when she claimed that, you know, uh, basically the, 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 the deprogramming of homosexuals wasn't taking part in Pima County. But if it was, it should be protected because parents should have the decision on whether or not children should be tortured to the point where they can claim they're no longer homosexual, bisexual, transgender. Uh, but her position on that is pretty hard right wing. Uh, people have been joking about her being the Trump of Pima County for a while. With the rejection of, of Trump's policies and politics that we've seen throughout uh, this last year since the election, do you think her base stands by her? Or do you think that the, the moderate Republican has a better chance in Congressional District 2? I don't know. I'm very cynical about the state of not just the Republican Party but the Republican electorate. Uh, especially in Cochise County where you've had a, um, let's just say there's, there's been an exodus of, uh, uh, well, you know, Cochise County used to be a very diverse place and, uh, the economy there is such that a lot of that diversity has left that county. And I'm not just talking about ethnic diversity, but I'm talking about diversity of opinion. Uh, a lot that was going on in Cochise County, maybe 20, 30 years ago is simply not happening. And in a lot of rural Arizona, there's been a tremendous, I'd say, a brain drain as people leave to seek economic opportunity elsewhere. You just leave behind these people who are just kind of bitter at everybody. And uh, that seems to be the Republican base right now. I mean, you see it nationwide, basically, the these highly populated areas are voting for Democrats, and then the uh, other areas feel left behind because they haven't really invested. Um, but I'm babbling now. But I just think it's going to be an interesting fight to see if someone else emerges. You know, uh, keep in mind. I mean, you know, that we we had this is a district that historically has nominated people like Randy Graff and Jesse Kelly. They, they have nominated Jesse Kelly, but we also saw Jesse Kelly lose by uh, it was five thousand votes in the special election in two thousand and twelve. Um, while while those folks might rise in the Republican primary, they hopefully get defeated. Uh, Martha McSally played off for a long time her moderate credentials. The, the, the 
the biggest strategy she used was not being seen in public, not going to a debate, making sure that there was limited debates, making sure that the, the audience for the debate wasn't going to be a wide audience who could see her. She ran on her paper credentials to make sure that people knew she was the first fighter pilot of all time ever in the United States military and that you know she was the person who could stand up. That she she stood up to the the government to fight for women in Afghanistan and Iraq when she was over there, and that she would stand up to Congress to make sure things happened. When you meet her in person, if you're one of the few people who actually gets an audience with our congresswoman, you, you see that that crumbles fairly quickly, and she's a lot of Republican talking points. Uh, somebody who's been well trained to say the right thing for a specific group of people. Allie Miller doesn't ha- seem to have that poise. We've seen her at times fly off the handle in supervisor meetings and when it comes down to social media and her hiring somebody to pretend to be somebody else then denying that they had any connection with her campaign or with her office when we've seen her her tirades about where road repairs are happening and how she's being picked on for daring to claim that people are getting more money in roads that need more repairs than on her personal streets where she tried to redirect county funds towards um i'm not sure if if miller has the the capacity to handle congressional district two where we see rises of conservatives and then they fall away again um, normally when a, a highly conservative candidate is put up the democrats have a much better chance of winning in congressional district two so maybe our best chance is for ali miller to enter this race yeah and, and i would i would disagree uh i i see where you're coming from on on uh what you ta- said with about martha mcsally but i would disagree that that she's been well trained um, she seems to give all of her talking points in this kind of uh, soulless monotone that's really downright creepy. So I'm not sure how well trained she is, but but we we do agree she's very good at giving talking points. And moving to a, another a position that Doug Ducey may have to appoint here, um, Jeff DeWitt was announced as a nominee by Trump for a Nansa finance position. Jeff DeWitt, of course, is Arizona's treasurer who famously came out against Doug Ducey on the Prop 123, the, the education funding debate last year, uh, early in last year. DeWitt says that he's going to keep his position until he is confirmed with the NASA position, but that uh, when the president of the United States asks you to serve your country, it is my duty to answer the call. That's a quote from Jeff DeWitt recently. I don't see any names we have for Democrats running for treasurer, and now with DeWitt possibly being gone before the 2018 election – and a a appointment by Governor Ducey being placed in there, Democrats might actually have a chance to step up and run against an unknown who wasn't elected by the populace. You know some of the players up in Phoenix a lot better than I do. Are there any Democrats you can see stepping up and, and capitalizing on this opportunity? I haven't heard any names. I mean, this, this story has happened very quickly. Um he- in the past, it's been very difficult to recruit people to run for this office, uh, and it's it's not uh, it's not an office that provides, at least on the Democratic side, provide. There's not a lot of incentive to want to run for it because there's a good chance you're going to lose. Uh, the uh, I remember that uh, Fred Duvall was very cynical about Ducey's candidacy when Ducey came forward as a candidate because he said that the treasurer is uh, basically an office you can phone in, so there's not a lot of opportunity to take a big public stand. So we're we're gonna uh, we're gonna head to a commercial for a moment, and then we'll be back. And we're back with Steve Leal's All Things Political. This is Jeremy Lasher and Tom Brzezelski sitting in for Steve Leal. Uh, we're gonna use the last segment of the show to talk a little more in depth about. Uh, the Alabama election has opened up a glaring problem we're seeing in the modern Democratic Party, and that's what exactly is wrong with white voters uh, throughout the country. The returns in Alabama show 98% of African-American women voted for Doug Jones, 93% of African-American men, uh, but we're seeing only 25% of white men and 35% of white women uh, vote for Doug Jones, and it's a problem we saw with Trump when we were looking at field operations throughout the 2016 election in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, the the Hillary campaign sent canvassers out to knock on doors for white, middle class, working class voters, uh, mostly union members who they thought were going to be on their side. 
And when those those packets came back, um, they weren't reviewed very well until, until afterwards, but we saw dramatic drops in people who used to be the, the bread and butter of the Democratic Party you know, a decade and a half ago who voted for Trump or didn't turn out to vote for Hillary because they saw the Democratic Party is not working for them. So how do we correct that issue? Well, I, I think, um, you know, Bobby Kennedy is on everybody's mind because of uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell's book and Chris Matthews' book right now. And, and one thing that people like to mention about Bobby Kennedy was that he would go, he would, when he would barnstorm the country, he would be making basically the same speech to everybody, regardless of if it was uh, in Apple, uh, to, uh, you know, Scots Irish descendants in Appalachia or African Americans in the Mississippi Delta or, or Mexicans in the San Joaquin Valley. He basically had the same message for everybody. And he basically sold a message, which was the same as the message Barack Obama was selling, which is, hey, we're all in this together. Uh, the Republicans have a different, very compelling message, which is the pie is only so big. And if we start to divide up that, if we start to let other people have a slice of that pie, that's less for you. And they say this in different ways, in different places. And uh the notion that, you know, whenever you see an African-American elected official, that means that some white guy is getting screwed over somewhere is is a very powerful one. And um, we need to uh, figure out a way to get people right again as far as, as understanding that we're one country. I mean, the, the Republicans have spent 45, 50 years narrowing down their message to three key points. It's Democrats are coming for your guns. Doesn't matter that it's never been true and that, you know, Democrats have never actually proposed full sweeping measures to take away guns. They've only suggested small safety measures that could help curb some of the more egregious gun violences. And with this being the, the fifth anniversary of, of the Newtown shootings, um, we even saw at that point we couldn't get with 20 dead children. We could not see common sense background check provisions pushed through. A few months ago, we had the, the Las Vegas shootings, and again, we couldn't see common sense that you know civilians didn't need to buy a bump stock or a gat crank that allowed you to pretend a gun was was uh, fully automatic. Um, but we saw Republicans stand firm on this, and the NRA coming out claiming that you know an attack on bump stocks was an attack on the American way of life. So Republicans have really honed in. That's their, their first message that comes out is Democrats are coming for your guns. The second message has been Democrats want to abort everybody, that abortion is a, a Democratic idea and that they are murdering babies left and right. And if you vote for a Democrat, God won't love you anymore and you're complicit in this. And the third message is the other, the danger of the other, whether it's terrorists who are coming for you or you know, African Americans committing more crime, even though we've seen that statistically that's not true, uh, or here in Arizona that you know build the wall, Latinos and then illegal immigrants are coming up here and then committing rapes and murders at astounding numbers. When again, when we look at the the statistics, illegal immigrants are actually less likely to commit crimes than people who were born in this country. So those three messages have allowed the Republicans to just completely hammer a base of uneducated voters over and over again and make them turn out repeatedly. Democrats, on the other hand, our messaging tends to be you know, broad but shallow. We, we have a message for every issue you're going to face, uh, but it's not in-depth. It's, it's very much a, a – feels like lip service to some of the issues. And part of the problems we've seen increase since Citizens United is that the, the money and the passion that used to be behind the Democratic Party has now been pulled off to a large number of nonprofits that each work on one significant issue but don't seem to actually be making any ground and in a lot of cases are losing ground. Well, yeah, and then there, there's the problem where, where someone's success in politics on the Democratic side these days is how much money did they raise. And so you see a lot of these groups that you're talking about uh, consider themselves successful – because they manage to pay all their staff consistently every year, not because they're making any progress on an issue or getting anybody elected. Um, to, just to say a little more about what you were saying about messaging is I heard an interesting item on NPR about Harold Washington. There was a, uh, an anniversary recently regarding Harold Washington, the first African-American mayor of Chicago. 
and they said that um, they made a few parallels with Barack Obama because David Axelrod apparently managed uh, Harold Washington's campaign. But they said that one of the attacks against Harold Washington was uh, that uh, crime was going up. And the way that they argued this, even though crime was actually going down in Chicago during this period, was they they were able to find a few stati- crime statistics that were actually going up. Because there's always, you know, if you have, you'll always be able to cherry pick some crime statistic that says crime is going up. And interestingly enough, that same soft on crime argument has been consistently used against nearly every African American politician throughout uh, throughout recent history, including Barack Obama. Crime was going down under Barack Obama, but violent crime was up in some cities. Therefore, the president was being soft on crime. And so they used the same argument against African-American and elected officials all the time. And it always seems to work because they know that a certain fragment of the white electorate is very scared of black crime. So they can use that. Well, I've seen this in friends and family who are rational people who who normally are on a more progressive bent on issues. But when you see police shootings happening or you see a black crime statistic come out, they're the first ones to, to jump on it and, and point out that this this is a problem. You know, the I'm not racist, but argument that we see from too many. And for the last couple of years, the, the Democratic response in the most part, including I'm guilty of this, too, has been to say, if you're saying this, you're racist. And that tends to shut down the argument. So my question would be, how do we get past our, our gut of calling somebody out as racist and to help them learn why their actions are racist on their own so that they might change those actions? Yeah, I, I think we do need to work on how we say that. Uh, you know, I, I w- attended uh, I attended Roots Camp last year, and that was a big problem I saw that when people are um, – when people are on uh, in in minority, you can't go and tell people in minority communities stop calling out white people for being racist. Try to be more gentle about it because you know they're they're suffering from it, and you can't just go and start telling them how to talk to other people. It's 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 a difficult one. Well, it's probably not something we're going to answer today, but I like that we're having the discussion. I hope we can continue it going forward. Uh, once again, it's a uh, third day of of Hanukkah, and Christmas is coming up. Uh, so I want to say thank you for uh, the African-American community in Alabama once again pulling our butts out of the fire and showing us where we did something wrong. And hopefully we'll actually take the time to learn from what they did right moving forward. I want to encourage everybody to go to TucsonProgressiveMedia.com to listen to this podcast. Uh, we're going to try and get this up on a number of different venues so that you can listen to it later. Uh, we will be having All Things Political next Thursday as well. we'll uh, Tom and I will both still be filling in for – Steve Leal at that point. But in the meantime, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays. And uh, Merry Christmas, because we can say it now. Just kidding. Talk to you all next week.